Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Um, just a couple of announcements. The Diet Lifestyle Intervention course starts tomorrow and um, I know that we always say enrollment had to be done by last Friday, but we're queens and kings of the last minute here. So if you decided that you wanted to take that course, um, which is a wonderful 15 st uh, class series that you can get CMEs if you're a doctor, CEs if you're a nurse or dietitian, um, and it is packed with information. You can also take it if you're a consumer. Anyway, starts tomorrow night and you still can sign up. The other thing is next week starts the Food Over Medicine coaching program. We're going to have our first live class. Um, the special offer, is the, 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 the tuition was really discounted quite a bit um, up until about a week ago. We don't have that anymore, but it still is not up to full price yet. And uh, there is time to get enrolled in order to participate in the class next week. And um, my goal, this is a pet project of mine right now, is to turn this Food Over Medicine coaching program into a big extension of Wellness Farm Health, where um, we help you develop your business in the area that you're in and that sort of thing. So this is something I'm going to be dedicating a lot of time to. And then feel free to uh, keep these calls coming about careers, whether it's the Food Over Medicine Coaching Program or anything else that you have on your mind that you'd like to talk about career-wise. And also free membership, a way to try things out. Um, we get emails every day from you guys wanting to become free members. It's a limited amount of information, but an opportunity for you to get a little bit of a sample of what we do here. So feel free to take advantage of that. My email address is pampopper at msn.com. I will get back to you, I promise. All right, a couple of interesting topics for today. Heart disease is still the leading cause of death in the United States, killing about 610,000 people a year and accounting for one in four deaths. That's bad news, no question. Uh, the good news is that coronary artery disease is one, to, one of the most preventable, but just as important, one of the most reversible conditions of all of the chronic diseases that you can develop. Um, some of you are familiar through the uh, through Forks Over Knives and other documentaries with Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic, who has an amazing 31-year, I believe is now, uh, track record in keeping even patients who have advanced disease and have literally been given up on by their expert cardiologists, keeping them alive for decades past their due date. So, and all of this is just with dietary intervention following a low-fat plant-based diet. Um, I thought what might be helpful um, is to tell you what is the mechanism of action that causes the diet to make people, as Dr. Esselstyn says, heart attack proof. Well, the mechanism by which diet works to reverse heart disease is that dietary change leads to regression and stabilization of an arterial plaques. And the reason this is important is these plaques rupture, and that's what causes heart attacks and strokes, and that's exactly what you want to avoid, and deaths from heart attacks and strokes. This has been documented in medical journals since, believe it or not, 1947, when a pathologist by the name of Sigmund Wylans reported that plaques, quote, usually but not invariably tend to undergo resorption. In other words, if you, they can disappear. Um, he didn't notice this in response to eating a plant-based diet. He noticed this in people who were malnourished, not eating enough calories and during autopsies of these people. And it was a curious observation. 40 years later, plaque regression was noted as a result of dietary change for the first time in the lifestyle heart trial. This prospective randomized controlled trial was led by Dr. Dean Ornish. You may have heard of Dr. Ornish, but not known the name of his first famous trial. It involved 28 patients who were assigned to an intervention group and 20 patients who were assigned to a group that just got usual care. The intervention group ate a low-fat vegetarian diet. They stopped smoking if they were smokers. They engaged in exercise and participated in stress management classes. At the first year, 82% of the patients in the intervention group had experienced plaque regression. And this took place even in the patients who had the most severe coronary artery disease. A larger study confirmed these results, concluding that, quote, I'm going to read this conclusion to you because I think it's important that you hear it verbatim. Dietary change alone retarded overall progression and increased overall regression of coronary artery disease. Dietary change alone. The authors noted that diet also decreased the frequency of total cardiovascular events. A 2015 meta-analysis, uh, which included 14 trials and combined analysis of over 2,000 plaques, concluded that, quote, intensive lifestyle modifications are associated with a decrease in coronary and carotid atherosclerotic burden. 
So the bottom line is that if you've eaten a diet that's really high in animal fat and protein and you've eaten a lot of junk food and you haven't taken care of yourself and you have coronary artery disease, all is not lost. This is why these studies document the um, experience that Dr. Esselstyn has had with his very, very severely ill patients, which is that um, you can make yourself heart attack proof by being willing to adopt a very low fat plant-based diet because the plaque in your artery, which all those plaques are at very high risk, one of them ruptures, you end up with a heart attack or stroke, those can be stabilized and they even begin to regress when you adopt the right diet. And I'll just finish, I, I love this statement that Dr. Esselstyn makes. He says, heart disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that does not need to exist, and if it does exist, it need not ever, ever progress. And um, what a great simple line that says so much, and that can pertain to you too. All right. Um, the next thing is a really interesting thing in my mind. Uh, the American Gut Project is the largest microbiome citizen science project in the world. Now, if you're not familiar with citizen science, um, it's relatively new. It's a term used to describe research projects that involve participation from the general public. Any person can join the American Gut Project by submitting a stool sample, filling out a questionnaire, and making a monetary contribution to cover the analysis of your particular sample. Those who choose to participate get an analysis of their own microbiome. They contribute to the greater good of scientific knowledge about the relationship between the microbiome and human health. The project is housed at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine. The project has published just recently its first major article which reports the results of over 10,000 analyses of stool samples. The researchers studied the types and quantities of microbes in each sample and they looked at factors like diet and the use of antibiotics and other factors on bacterial composition. Several relationships were identified. One was that the greater the diversity of plants in the diet, the more diverse the microbes in the gut. The number of different plants eaten was more important than identification with a particular diet type such as vegan or vegetarian in determining microbial diversity. Eating a variety of plants also led to greater production of an entire repertoire of beneficial molecules that are produced by your beneficial bacteria, like short-chain fatty acids. And the researchers said that when you eat a variety of plants, you're talking about a variety of different fibers and resistant starches in the diet. Eating a plant-based diet was also associated with a reduction in antibiotic resistance genes and the effect was dose dependent. Eating 30 types of plants per week resulted in significantly fewer antibiotic resistance genes as compared to eating 10 or fewer different plants every week. Due to the large number of samples that the researchers have had access to, several comparisons were possible, including comparing these uh, analysis of the samples of people who took antibiotics the week before they submitted their sample um, versus those who said and reported that they had not taken antibiotics in a year or longer. Those who had recently taken antibiotics had less bacterial diversity, but also more diversity of other molecules in the microbiome that don't normally reside there. In other words, beneficial bacteria decrease and metabolites that are not normally found in the gut increase in response to taking antibiotics and the effect is greater in people who recently took antibiotics than people who hadn't taken them for a good long while. Also, and I thought this was very interesting, many subjects who reported not taking antibiotics any time in the recent past had evidence in their, of antibiotics in their uh, microbes and microbiomes anyway. And you know why this was? Because they were eating animals that had been given antibiotics on livestock farms. Antibiotics fed to animals that are consumed for food do end up in humans where they alter the gut bacteria and have a potentially negative influence on health. So the bottom line is that many people will say, oh, I haven't taken antibiotics. Well, if you're eating conventionally grown livestock, chickens or beef and that sort of thing, or fish that's farmed, um, you are most certainly taking in antibiotics almost with every meal that you consume these things. Now there's a sister program called the British Gut Project, which allowed researchers to compare samples between residents of the United Kingdom and residents of the United States. Those living in the UK generally had more microbial diversity than those living in the United States. Samples from both populations, by the way, showed that microbial populations are different in people who are depressed. 
So now the plan is to continue with the United States and the UK, and then they're going to expand their research beyond to have um, a, a British, you know, British gut project and a Dutch gut project and, and accumulate data from all over the world to look at comparisons, but also to gather more data on the relationship between the gut microbiome and health. And this is really important because um, I read in an article not too long ago that 90% of the information that has been published about the gut microbiome has been published in medical journals starting in 2004, which means that the vast majority of people in practice right now who are in healthcare practice don't know anything about this at all. It's not their fault. There was not that much to learn until recently. So I think anything that adds to the body of evidence is really, really important. And the gut microbiome has turned out to be so crucial and important for health that, um, uh, that, that this is uh, this is really significant what these people are doing. All right, that's all for today. Um, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.